full circle, yes, we roll. Stage 360 degrees, high high, 360 degrees, high high, 306, 306, 360 degrees, high high. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Full Circle, your cultural affairs radio magazine produced by members of the KPFA First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Broadcasting from right here in Huchin, occupied Ohlone territory, also known to settlers as Berkeley. Well, Monday was Indigenous Peoples Day. This year, due to COVID-19, the regular gathering on Alcatraz was limited to only 50 people. First Voice apprentices were honored to be part of the four-person broadcast crew for Radio Free Alcatraz. On tonight's show, we'll hear sounds from the opening of this year's sunrise ceremony. We'll also speak with First Voice graduate, Sarah LaFleur Better about her documentary film The Sacred and the Snake Also to close out the show tonight we'll get a special tribute from graduate apprentice Bernard Henderson on the Million Man March which happened at the nation's capital 25 years ago today All that tonight on Full Circle I am your host Free Will and Franklin Keep it locked right here to KPFA Again, welcome to Full Circle here on 94.1 FM and kpfa.org. As I mentioned in the opening, Monday marked another Indigenous Peoples Day here in Berkeley and around the nation. What used to be a day honoring a lost Spanish pirate is being reclaimed as Indigenous Peoples Day. And, as has been tradition here in the Bay Area, people were set to gather on Alcatraz Island to share prayers and ceremony. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the public portion of the event was canceled this year and a special ceremony was held instead at Golden Gate Park. However, a small group of 50 people were allowed on the rock to perform the sacred dances and prayers in front of the sacred fire. In order to send out our traditional broadcast, part of that group was the KPFA Radio Free Alcatraz crew. Miguel Gavilan Molina, Sarah Blanco, myself, Free Will and Franklin, and engineer extraordinaire Miguel Molina Jr., a.k.a. Falcone. Here is the opening of the Indigenous Peoples Day Ceremony, broadcast live on KPFA from Alcatraz, Monday morning. Teresa and we, good morning. It's good to be here with all of you. Um, you know, growing up, um, this was the way that, that it was when we would come out to the island. We only had one boat and all, you know, be able to to come together as, as a small group. And so we just want to send our prayers um, and good energy out to, to everyone that's listening, everyone that can't be here with us. And just know that the small group of us that's here, that's able to be here this morning, that we are sending those prayers for you. So I just want to introduce myself. My name's Morning Star Galley. I'm here with the International Indian Treaty Council, and so IITC has been holding the Sunrise Gathering here for uh, close to 40 years now, and it's an honor of our Alcatraz veterans, of the resistors from 1969 to 1971 that held this island for 19 months, and it's really an honor to have so many veterans and their family members here with us in this circle, so thank you. So it was no disrespect to anyone, you know, in terms of who we were able to bring. We wanted to prioritize the dance groups and wanted to prioritize having, um, you know, the veterans here with their families. And so for those of of uh, everyone out there that weren't able to make it, you know, that 
we'll we'll be able to gather again here soon but we just have to do things safely at this time um so with that we're going to go into the first um we have an Ohlone welcoming uh, by Greg Castro, Ramatush Ohlone. And so we're going to start with that and then we will go into our um, our next speaker. So thank you. Kershaw, oh. Tuhi. In the indigenous language of my Ramatush ancestors who have been in the Central Coast California land since time immemorial, greetings my relatives. My name is Greg Castro, and I'm an indigenous California person of the Ramatush and Rumson Ohlone and Tropical Salinan tribal communities. I am humbled and honored to have been asked to give proper respect and acknowledgement to my Ramatush Ohlone relatives of this land. Hayene, Hersha, Pesha, Walrap, Ramatush Ohlone. Welcome to the homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone people. I offer greetings on behalf of Ramatush Ohlone tribal chair. Jonathan Cordero of the Association of Ramatush Ohlone People. Although our ancestors were the first victims of colonial gentrification in this peninsula many generations ago, the Ramatush people have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their sacred obligations and responsibilities as the original descendants and caretakers of this place that is Yalamu, what is now called San Francisco. For indigenous people, the sacred obligations as caretakers given us by creator when she placed us in our origin places have never been relinquished nor extinguished. Our ancestors sacrificed greatly, even to the giving of their very lives so that we, their descendants, could continue to fulfill our responsibilities as stewards of our homelands into modern times. On behalf of my Ramatush Ohlone relatives, I now ask you all as our guests in Iyalamu that while you are here at this gathering, that you also willingly take up these responsibilities and obligations of stewardship that come with the gifts and privileges of your visit to this still beautiful but radically changed landscape of the Ramatush ancestral homelands. While here at this gathering, we can all choose to learn and share how to steward not only the land, but each other. For we are all bound up in this basket of life that Creator has weaved that holds us and takes care of us. We must now take care of that life basket that we have greatly wounded. So show this care to one another. Oh. 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 Um, I'm now going to ask for Andrea Carmen to come up. Andrea Carmen is the executive director of the International Indian Treaty Council. Um, we hear for the folks that are listening on the radio on KPFA 94.1 FM. Um, we're here on Radio Free Alcatraz. There's a group of less than 50 of us gathered here around the fire. And so we're here this morning offering our, our prayers and respect to everyone that's that's uh -oh. tuning in from all over the world. So uh -oh. thank you for being here with us also. Oh. Uh -oh. Morning Star, thank you so much to each one of you who's here and everyone that's joining us in this prayer circle uh, from uh, the radio and around the world that know why we're here as we do in our hearts. This year we had our Yaki Nation um, main ceremonies, the Deer Dance ceremonies, uh, right when the pandemic was uh, starting to really take hold in Arizona and in many places around the world. And we had our ceremonies. We have to do those to restore the balance of positive and negative in the world, not just for our nation, but for um, everyone. And, and all the natural world. And that's our teaching and belief. But we had to do it different. Uh, we couldn't have all of the people from the community. I'm part of the um, uh, cultural cooks, uh, the cocineras uh, culturales that cook for the ceremony. And we had to do that different too. And I learned something from the ceremony as we all should from our ceremonies. Um, that I took into our work at the International Indian Treaty Council and into uh, this beautiful morning here that you may have to do things differently sometimes. We are um, experts at adapting to uh, whatever the colonizers throw at us next. 
That's why we survived. And we honor our ancestors for um, all they went through, which is much more than what we're going through now. But thinking about today and with the support of everyone that's here and all of our leaders um, from the outside that we're representing here today, um, we realize that we can still do what's most important. We don't have all our brothers and sisters. We don't have a circle of thousands uh, that are usually here, except those that are joining us from um, the airwaves. We still have that circle of thousands and millions uh, that we're representing here today. But the important thing is we can offer the prayers. We can offer our songs. We can offer our dances. We still have the sacred fire. We still have those medicines and those knowledge. And we know we're in a hard time. Usually um, at, this, at this time, on this day, I talk about the landing of the colonial pirates. What is it today? Today, um, 528 years ago. And they brought, first of all, they brought their lost, sick selves and our brothers and sisters that we still um, have in our circle at the International Indian Treaty Council of the Taino peoples um, took care of them and fed them because they were ignorant. They didn't know about these sicknesses they were bringing to us. And through all of these years, all of those 500 and more years, we've suffered from pandemics and biological warfare, sometimes intentionally brought smallpox blankets, measles brought in by the miners, the colonizers, and the missionaries. Sometimes it was just through negligence and ignorance about these things. They don't understand that if you let yourselves be out of balance with our sacred natural world, these things will happen. These things will keep happening. So we know we have to stay strong. We know that this is not the day of colonial pirates. I won't even say his name in this circle. It's too important right now what we're doing here to distract ourselves with remembering the name that uh, the colonizers still give to this day. We've taken it back. It's Indigenous Peoples Day. It's a day of solidarity with the indigenous peoples of this entire continent from Alaska all the way down to Argentina and out to the Caribbean. This is our day. This is our moment, and we know whatever we've been through, we've all lost very special people in our nations. The elders, the knowledge holders, the language speakers are the most affected by this pandemic, and we have lost a lot of them in our nation as well. We lost one of our board members from our nation, our Yaqui nation, passed away on August 31st, Mariano Ochoa Milan. He passed away in, in uh, Sonora, Mexico from this disease. And we all share that loss. But I just want to confirm with you today, through these prayers, through these dances, through the commitment and the solidarity we feel for each other, our circle is not small. Our circle is millions. And today we are affirming that even though there are tears in our eyes, our minds are focused, our commitment is unwavering, and our hearts are strong. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm introducing um, um, something very special for us uh, from our Yaqui Nation in honor uh, of Mariano Ochoa. Um, from the Board of Directors of International and Treaty Council, a very strong, beautiful, uh, dynamic uh, leader. Um, Angel Valencia, one of our cultural leaders and participants, is here, and he's going to offer a prayer, not just for Mariano, but uh, for all. And he told me, don't say that they've been lost. They're making their journey to, as we say, the, the Sewa Anya, the Sewa Huya, the flower world. And they'll continue to help us and guide us from there. We believe that they become the stars that guide us um, on our path. And their spirits are here. The, the blessings and the teachings they, they left us are here. So he's going to be offering uh, a prayer 
um, not just for um, those that are making their way and made their way to the to the beautiful spirit world, but also um, the families they left behind who need our comfort from our prayers and those that are sick and struggling, especially isolated in the hospitals. That's not our way of uh, taking care of our peoples, but that's what's been um, given to us at this time to endure. Um, and and to everyone who uh, whose health is still strong, that you that you remain strong. So I'd like to introduce Angel Valencia. He's going to be doing his prayer in the Yaqui language, our language. Bendita. <laughs> Que acaita cante elam. Que acaita sevam. Que acaita imam mi misterio po. Pues ewe ma. En chin que apti. En chin que apti te equipamos a me. Saiba. Alla de acá. En chin en belec. Becle catana. Dios ta achai. Dios ta uzi. Dios ta. En chin le vais a eme. Dios está hacha ahí. Dios está Lucy. Dios está en Chimambo de Agua. Pues es hoy, para sí me está. Y le usen. Y acá de coco. Él es amor, chica. Y acá de coco, que chica. Pues entre yo, güey. Y tomar la yo, güey. Y tomar la hacha y yo, güey. Santa bendición, la ama de esta. Así me está, gente po, indígena, bendice un tabata que chía. Todo salió y güey, que está bien, hasta mi cosa buen boy o lema. Todo salió y güey, que está bien, hasta mi cosa buen boy o lema. Todo salió y güey, que está bien, hasta mi cosa buen boy o lema. Cosa le ve que está bien, a otra vez que se ven por yo le no. Ay, aman, tú se llevó y lo fui a tan ahí, si con eso, con la juguía, po. Cosa le ve que está bien, a otra vez que se ven por yo le no. Oh. 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 Gracias. Thank you very much. Oh. 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 Circle here on 94.1 FM, KPFA, and KPFA.org. I am your host tonight, Free Will and Franklin, and that song you just heard was the Pomo Singers recorded live on Alcatraz Island last Monday, Indigenous Peoples Day 2020. To hear the ceremony in its entirety, check out our website, kpfaapprentice.org, just after the show. And we'll have a link to the archive and some pictures there. Now, in our next segment, we continue in the theme of indigenous people. When the protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline jumped off in Standing Rock, First Voice Apprentice graduate Sarah LaFleur Vetter traveled to the Dakotas to document what was happening. She collected hours of footage and is now working to release a film called The Sacred and the snake. Let's check out the audio from the promotional video, and when we return, we'll speak with Sarah LaFleur Vetter and two members of the production team. Cheryl Angel and Jordan Murray brings three white horses, Daniel. Stay tuned. We are in the midst of a massive cultural shift worldwide. People are opening their eyes to racial injustice, settler colonialist culture, and white supremacy. 
This film underscores how extractive industries continue to inflict violence on indigenous people. This is a critical time in American history. Donald Trump's administration accelerated the completion of the Dakota Access Pipeline and oversaw the destruction of public and indigenous lands on an unprecedented scale. He normalized and popularized his white supremacist policies, emboldening racism and hatred. With your support, we can show a drastically different vision for this country's relationship to indigenous peoples and the environment. This film highlights indigenous women, two-spirit, and non-binary activists by following Lauren, Olive, and Cheryl for nearly four years, beginning with their transformative time at the Standing Rock resistance camps in 2016. They try to protect the Missouri River from the $4 billion Dakota Access Pipeline by halting construction and maintaining a presence on the proposed route. But after months of clashes with militarized police and blizzards, the encampments are raided, the pipeline is completed, and our participants have to go home. The violence of big oil on their sacred lands shows the direct connection between the genocide of their people, the abuse of the land and the water, and their own personal traumas. We show how this empowering and devastating experience lit a fire within each one of them to take the lessons of Standing Rock back to their own communities and reclaim them. We're honored that these activists entrusted us with their stories. And we're really privileged to work alongside some really prolific Native producers to make sure that this story is told from a Native perspective. Our story follows activists from Standing Rock's inception to the present day. The fight didn't end when the camps were evicted. Black, brown, and indigenous Americans have been fighting their erasure for hundreds of years. The urgency to highlight their stories is now greater than ever. It is the young people who must take the lead. On June 2nd, 1924, 94 years ago, the United States granted indigenous people the American citizenship. So I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for doing that and also welcome to our country. Um, we hope you'll see this film and this campaign as an opportunity to be part of historic change and elevate the voices of indigenous women, two-spirit, and non-binary people who are at the very forefront of the fight for the environment and for their people's very survival. Thank you. All right, welcome back. That was some sound from the film, The Sacred and the Snake being directed and produced by a small crew, including our own graduate apprentice, Sarah LaFleur Vedder. Welcome back, Sarah. How you been? Thank you so much for having me, Franklin. So cool to see you again and be back on, on KPFA. I'm super stoked to be here today. All right, great to have you. Also, we have Jordan Marie brings three white horses, Daniel. Jordan, how are you doing today? Thanks for being here. Wopila, thank you for having my voice along with the other voices part of this project and on this uh, cast. Um, thank you so much for having me, and it's an honor. Thank you. It's an honor to have you. Thanks for all the work that you're doing. And also joining us is Cheryl Angel, and some of you may be following her on Facebook. How you doing, Cheryl? Good to see you again. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor and a blessing for me to be in this circle, and I really like the title of Full Circle because I feel... Um, that's where our path should be leading us, full circle. Right on. Well, uh, I appreciate that. LaFleur, Sarah LaFleur, how are you? Tell us first a little bit about your background and then what got you in to getting to Standing Rock and documenting, um, collecting all this footage that you did. Absolutely. My journalism career, I have to really thank KPFA. Um, that's where I was steeped in my progressive politics. Um, it's where I learned how to be a good citizen. And um, I have to thank the apprenticeship for um, really teaching me about the importance of journalism in our in our communities. And um, from there, uh, the, the journalism school, the Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism, kind of launched my, my documentary training. And as far as Standing Rock is concerned... Um, I was always interested in indigenous peoples from a young age, but I was 
never given the chance to really learn very much about them. They, there wasn't more than a few paragraphs in our history books growing up. And it wasn't until later in life that I had an opportunity to really learn about indigenous peoples. And of course, uh, Franklin, you were one of my very first indigenous friends. And um, from there, when, when I saw what was happening at Standing Rock, I had an opportunity to kind of, you know, leave my, my responsibilities back home in the Bay and go check it out. I wanted to do some reporting, but once I got there, I found that I couldn't leave. I needed to stay and, and do as much coverage as I could. And I felt like it was really history in the making happening. And I would like to give um, my producer Jordan an opportunity to talk about how Standing Rock started um, because there's a really amazing story there that involves youth and running and it all goes back to a couple youth runners back in 2016. So I want to give her the chance to speak. Yeah, it's my my connection to, you know, this movement and the fight to protect, you know, Uchu Maka, Grandmother Earth and our water and our lands and our relatives began really, you know, getting a phone call from a friend named Gary who is native and he had reached out to me asking, hey, a bunch of youth are going to be running from Cannonball, North Dakota to Washington, D.C. to help raise awareness and deliver a petition opposing the Dakota Access Pipeline. And he's like, well, you're a runner. Maybe you can do something. And so I was like, OK, well, I had never um, organized any any sort of events, um, just attended and always was in that kind of supporting volunteering role in the local D.C. activism world when it came to the KXL pipeline and the Potomac pipeline um, and other initiatives. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll just organize, you know, another run for them and we can run from, let's say, the Capitol or the Supreme Court to Army Corps of Engineer headquarters. And so I was like, hopefully they'll be OK with running maybe another two or three miles and luckily um, respect our water who I was talking with um, and, and doing a lot of the planning. We're all for it. And so we organized run for water rally um, from the Supreme Court to Army Corps of Engineers. And so we began that day with land acknowledgement and prayer and um, just being able to, to talk with all of the youth who were there and listening to their stories. And I got to meet um, Danny Grassroop, who I found out was my cousin um, back in Lower Brule, which is where I'm from, the Lower Brule Indian Reservation, and um, just really saw this hope, saw this perfect representation of what I want our future to be and seeing our Native youth just take the lead, willing to put their bodies under this kind of stress, willing to do whatever it takes to protect our resources and our, our water and our people and our treaties and our lands, all for our next generations and looking ahead, you know, it was just so inspiring and motivating. And it was an all-day event. We ran from the Supreme Court. We had police escort. We had we had um, songs and drums playing the whole way as we were running and walking. And then we finally got to the headquarters and we just had a little encampment there and just stayed there trying to have conversations with people who were walking in and out. Um, we also organized some private meetings that were just with the youth, no chaperones, no adults, with some White House officials, Army Corps officials, and then also connected them with the Center for Native American Youth for some other um, speaking opportunities to talk about this. And so it was such an incredible opportunity. And then that went into day two, the next day where we had, um, or Respect Our Water organized a, a protest in front of the White House uh, to help help bring this message to fruition and, and to light and to speak with more people to talk about this because this was pre, you know, Facebook Live, um, which is really kind of what, you know, got the movement really visible. And then with help of um, Amy Goodman of Democracy Now! and documenting what happened with the dog attacks on September 3rd and really putting it in the limelight. Um, you know, this was a chance for, for the youth to have their voices heard and to take that lead, especially with this call to action with LaDonna Brable Allard and um, the Sacred Stone Camp and the other, other youth that are going to be reflected in this story, as well as seeing other youth that are still part of this, um, that are still doing all of the hard work in our communities, um, you know, across Turtle Island and still, you know, making their voices heard, still organizing in their communities and still fighting for the very same things, even if it's not specifically connected to the Dakota Access Pipeline. 
And so, yeah, that's, that's how I began my um, role in community organizing. And that's how I founded Rising Hearts. It was born out of the Standing Rock movement because I saw the lack of representation of Indigenous voices on those platforms, especially when other organizations were organizing on behalf of Native people, but didn't include them or us in those spaces. And so, yeah, it's an honor to be part of this project and to, to help get their stories heard. Thank you. That's the voice of Jordan Marie Brings Three White Horses. Daniel, she's part of the crew, the co-producer of The Sacred and the Snake, along with our other guest, Sarah Lafleur Better. And we have another guest that's about to join us. Cheryl Angel is also part of the team. And first of all, Cheryl, let me just say um, it's good to see you. Good to see you healthy. I understand you had um, a battle with the COVID, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, But let's talk about your part of the film and, you know, what got you to Standing Rock and what got you to be a part of this film. My involvement with water started at the uh, Rosebud Sioux Tribe spiritual camp that we set up to fight the KXL Keystone Pipeline in 2014. Um, That camp was an outreach camp. We did set up several teepees. We invited people. We um, showed them the basics. We showed them the facts. We showed them um, the dangers um, because we did an all-around teaching, and then we asked for their support. So our camp um, was a spiritual camp, um, a resistance camp, and it was also an outreach camp. So people would come in with their vans because we were in the middle of the middle of definitely nowhere where people would look like because there's nothing visible for miles. And we set up our teepees on the middle of the top of, in the middle of what used to be a cornfield. And we occupied that space and we generated um, support to stop the KXL pipeline, which eventually led to President Obama um, denying the permit. Um, so there was a lot of learning, a lot of work, um, a lot of spiritual work. Um, a lot of activism, um, and we, we were pipeline fighters. And then I transitioned into Standing Rock whenever they asked for help. Like, how did you start your camp? Um, and the basics and the people who helped actually did most of the, started the camp for us, they lent all of their knowledge and their, their resources to the Standing Rock camp. So when Cannibal um, Camp started, the first resident there on that night was somebody from the Rosebud camp because that's, uh, that was one of the things that um, we really believe in to the bottom of our souls. Um, The highest level of our spirituality is protecting the water. So we transitioned from pipeline biters to water protectors. That was the voice of Cheryl Angel there. And she was talking about her involvement in first the Keystone XL pipeline and then how she got to Standing Rock and to fight the Dakota Access pipeline there and to, you know, share the knowledge because that's how um, this is being done is through shared knowledge. Let me jump back to Jordan real quick because a lot of people don't connect the pipeline and MMIW and murder missing indigenous women. How does pipeline construction connect to the problem of missing and murdered indigenous women. And then um, talk about what you do and using this film and using your own running um, to bring awareness to that. Thank you so much for, for bringing up this this issue and epidemic and a really heartbreaking reality that is happening um, continuously in our community since 1492. Um, I first learned really um, about this epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women after attending my first rally um, back in D.C. with the Reject and Protect uh, Cowboy Indian Alliance rally that happened in D.C. And so that's where my my journey of understanding this devastating relationship of fossil fuel extraction, dirty infrastructure projects is having on our resources, on our lands and on our bodies. And, and hearing from Candy of Indigenous Environmental Network and other aunties and grandmas speaking to this injustice of high rates of sexual violence, domestic assault, human sex trafficking and drug trafficking and the violence that it brings to our communities when these pipelines are built because of the man camps. Man camps I'm not saying that every person that is living on a man camp is a culprit or at fault, but because of these man camps, because they are being placed 
near marginalized communities or indigenous communities on reservations, border towns or reserves if you're in Canada. Um, it's bringing this high rates of violence. It's this correlation of, you know, the violence against the earth is violence against women. And this is a relationship that we need to um, really pay attention to and understand. And so ever since 2014, I have been on this learning journey of learning who the advocates are, learning who the families are, learning how to support them. And in the last couple of years, I've really kind of taken it a step further because I feel like this epidemic is not getting the support and visibility that it needs and deserves, especially for the families who have lost loved ones um, and who are fighting for justice, fighting for visibility, fighting to be heard and fighting for healing is that I have intersected it with, with my passion of running, with my passion of advocacy and dedicating every single race that I've had or run in prayer, um, really saying those prayers out loud and, and, and calling out their name and saying it for their families, saying it for their communities and, and, and praying for our next generation so that they no longer have targets on their backs so that my cousin, I don't need to worry about my cousins or my nieces or my nephews or my, my mom or my best friends or any woman, because this is such a problem um, in our, in our communities across the nation. And so we need to understand when we talk about dirty infrastructure projects, fossil fuel projects of how this is raping and pillaging our earth, that this is also doing the same destruction and devastation to our bodies, not only in a, in an, a physical assault sense, but it's also damaging our lungs, our air. It's, it's, it's just bringing so much bad <laughs> into, into our bodies, into our communities. Um, and so as we are, are fighting for our next generations and calling for, um, you know, no more fossil fuels and, and keep it in the ground campaigns and looking, to, looking ahead and looking towards, you know, a just transition and a transform, transformational change um, and what that looks like of clean, renewable energy um, and investing in the communities rather than investing in dirty fossil fuel projects. We need to um, remember all of the people, all of, all of our sisters and our relatives um, that have been impacted by, by this violence. And so I'm really happy to see slowly that this change, this attention is, is getting what it needs um, by starting to see some legislation being proposed that will help address and combat this epidemic and issue. Um, and hopefully one day we, we won't be statistics anymore, not for, not for this reason. Thank you again, Jordan. Lafleur, let's go back to you, Sarah Lafleur Vetter. We're getting a little short on time, and I want to ask you, Lafleur, you know, why did you create this film? What's the mission of this film, The Sacred and the Snake? And and then just briefly, can you touch on being an ally, not only an ally, but an accomplice, which is something I'm kind of learning about from somebody that an ally might stand up for you and say, hey, I'm with you, but an accomplice is out there with you um, doing the work. And so the hopes of the film, Lafleur, tell us about that and then talk about being um, an ally slash accomplice who's out there, you know, fighting the fight. Thank you. That's such a good question. The Sacred and the Snake the goal of the film is to really amplify indigenous and non-binary voices, particularly, you know, these indigenous women and two-spirit non-binary people that frontlined the Standing Rock movement. These are the voices that have been most historically silenced, and we want to choose to amplify and elevate with this, with this project. Um, as far as being an ally and an accomplice, which are such loaded terms these days. And here in 2020, we could have a whole show about these words. Um, I think there's a lot of performative allyship happening. And it's always been, I think what I've learned this year is that I can't really call myself an ally or an accomplice, that it's really up to my, my indigenous colleagues, my indigenous friends to determine, you know, when my work is, is being helpful. You know, I don't think it's up to, um, non-Indigenous people to decide, um, our impact, you know, it's, it's up to the Indigenous folks to decide, okay, this is, this is a productive project. So that's been really important. And that's been at the heart of my work with this project is making sure that it is doing good for the community that it depicts, that it is not a performative project, but, um, we're doing, we're trying our best to listen to our 
participants and do everything we can to actually help them with the issues that need the most work right now. And if we're talking about the issues that need the most work right now, it might be a good time to transition to talking about how this administration has handled the COVID epidemic, especially in regards to um, our tribal communities. Um, and I also wanted to give Cheryl a chance to talk about how her and her family took on the goal of fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline as a family and the sacrifice that they've made. Yeah, let's do that, Cheryl. Um, it's your time. Tell us about, uh, you know, how your you and your family have taken on these fights uh, against these pipelines, and basically, you know, the to protect water, earth, you know, our air, you know, what we need, and then give us an update on you and your family because I know that you've had um, a battle and are currently um, fighting for the health and the life of family members. I want to say first of all, I want to express my gratitude for everyone who has been providing support for people like me, who look like me, who sound like me, who talk like me, because um, historically, as LaFleur had stated, there isn't uh, any space for us anymore because all of the space has been occupied and uh, we were pushed into such small areas um, it was easy for us to retain our the basics of our humanity and our culture because we were so close together and we didn't want to let go because that's what that's all we had that's all we still have and it's enough so i want to say thank you for those who are supporting uh people whose voices have been silenced over the years and that includes the murdered and missing indigenous women and all of these grassroots movements, our voices are have always been um, the leading sound, the charging sound, the, the sound um, that changes people's hearts is our stories and our voices. And um, in uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline, I took my sons there. I took them from, uh, we had all been at the KXL camp in Rosebud the spiritual camp in Rosebud, and then we transitioned into the DAPL camp. We all went to Sacred Stone. Um, my son could feel the need for the truth to be told um, in a courageous way that would touch the hearts of everybody else and make the understanding clear that our water is under attack and that pipelines really are our enemy if we want to find and maintain the balance between the earth and, and, and mankind. Um, we can't be supportive of extractive, the extractive industry because they are literally ripping up our planet and they're really destroying um, the essence, the grass roots, literally the roots of the earth. They're ripping them up out of the ground and they're taking the, the minerals, which is the essence of the planet, um, for profit without any thoughts of concern for the future of mankind. So I see a race, I see a race right now, um, a race of people who put profits before people and that need that they have, that's our enemy. Uh, my family, my son, my son happy, um, locked down to an excavator because that's what you have to do sometimes for people to understand just how deadly it is and, just, and the need to stop. The need to stop those machines is real. It needs to be done every day. Everywhere there's a pipeline. Everywhere there's a machine that's ripping up the earth. And the same for murdered indigenous women. It's not just an epidemic. It's America's genocidal history. It's, it's a really bad mark on Turtle Island, but it, it comes from greed. People want to make money off that oil. Men who have no choice but to go work in the oil fields because their economy is failing. They don't have a personal business. They go work at these places. Not all of them are good. And we suffer. Indigenous people have been suffering for centuries. But you're still here praying. We still have our spirituality. 
And that's why I'm so thankful for the people who support not only during COVID times, because I had COVID healing and I cried when I couldn't breathe. But she told me what to do. She said, keep breathing. And I sat in, a, I sat in steam, total steam. And I prayed and I cried. And she said, keep breathing. Keep breathing. And I, when, I, when it was so painful to breathe, when I couldn't breathe, I had to anyway because I wanted to live. Now my son has COVID and he went through the same thing, only worse because he has other underlying issues. Well, uh, well thank you, Cheryl uh, Angel, very much. Uh, those are the words of Cheryl Angel, always wise words to hear. And we are getting a little low on time, but I appreciate um, all that you said. And we um, are continuing to send prayers to you and, you know, to the world to survive this this covid epidemic um everyone out there needs the prayers uh lafleur we're about to wrap up here before we go can you tell people where they could follow the sacred and the snake i understand now you're you're kicking off your film and you are looking for support tell us how we can get involved and where we could find and watch more of the film absolutely um folks can go to our website the sacred and the snake.com um, you'll also see a link there to our crowdfunding campaign on Seed and Spark. You can also go to Seed and Spark's homepage. Our project is on the homepage. And uh, yeah, on that um, homepage, on that campaign, you'll see our trail, you'll see, all, see our pitch, and you'll learn about how you can support these indigenous voices and the voices that frontline the movement for the environment and indigenous sovereignty. And just a reminder to everyone out there that we will post all the links to Lifler's film on our website kpfaapprentice.org and I want to give a big shout out and thank you to our guest today Jordan Marie brings three white horses Daniel of course Sarah Lafleur Vetter graduate apprentice and Cheryl Angel always with the wise words um, we are out of time I want to thank you all for joining me today and actually I look forward into um, digging more into this film I'm glad I got to meet you Jordan and I'll hang on to your connection we'll get you back on the air and of course it's always good to hear and see Cheryl Angel you can follow her on Facebook for more updates um, on life and what she's doing and the battle against COVID she's on uh, Facebook, Cheryl Angel. And another shout out to Sarah LaFleur, better graduate apprentice. Um, thank you all for joining me tonight on Full Circle. Full Circle on 94.1 KPFA and KPFA.org. That song you just heard was Mini Wachoni by the Cherry Creek Singers. And that song was basically the song of the No Dapple movement. And before that, we heard excerpts from an interview with part of the production crew for the new documentary film, The Sacred and the Snake, being directed and produced in part by First Voice graduate, Sarah LaFleur Vetter. To hear edited portions of that interview, including information on new legislation signed by Donald Trump for murdered and missing indigenous women, and more from Cheryl Angel about the fight against COVID-19 in tribal communities, go to our website, kpfaapprentice.org, just after the show. Now, to close out the show tonight, 
We will hear from graduate apprentice Bernard Henderson with a special tribute to the 25th anniversary of the Million Man March, held 25 years ago to this day in 1995. 25-year anniversary of the Million Man March. Louis Farrakhan called on African-American men to gather in Washington, D.C. on October 16, 1995. Local chapters of the NAACP, the National African American Leadership Summit, and the Nation of Islam helped to organize the march. African American men from all over the U.S. joined the march on Capitol Hill. Listen to what a few of the marchers had to say. I love you! As of 10 o'clock this morning, we reach one million black men! Uh, this day is our day, and we want to let them know that the black contingents of men, women, and children have a significant vote in this country. Man, this, is, this isn't about uh, Farrakhan. This is about respect, unity, and love for the brothers. And we're trying to get something out of this, out of life. We're tired of being behind everything. We want to be in charge sometimes. We want to unify, and that's what this is about. Unity. Look at all these brothers around here. We need to do and do it and show the government, hey, that we need, we need to have control of our destiny. A teenage orator and motivational speaker, Allende Jean Baptiste, gained national attention when he was invited to speak at the Million Man's March in Washington, D.C. At the age of 12, John Baptiste was the youngest speaker. Listen to his powerful message. <laughs> My fathers, my brothers, I lift up my voice and raise it high, telling the stories of your children's cries for our ability to survive the onslaught of the enemy's drugs, guns, and alcohol. His prisons and his killing fields depends directly on whether you are willing to stand up and resist the outrages that are being heaped upon us as a people and build a new society. Yes, the task is difficult. The odds are against you. But you must organize to find a way or make your own way. You must change today so that tomorrow may dare to be different. And when you have fought back and regained your pride, when you have won some battles, when you are able to tell the stories of your heroism, when you can pass on to your young the tradition of struggle through examples of your having stood up for a better tomorrow when you take control of our institutions our media our schools when you maximize our economic resources towards our own benefits when you stop making excuses when you start standing with our mothers when you stick it out with your families when you start mentoring our young when you start teaching us to be humane, then we can build a new nation of strong people. Your sons and daughters will no longer need to belong to gangs because they do belong. Our youth will no longer be seeking drugs as an escape because they would have outlets in our society to develop themselves. When you start setting the conditions for our youth to fulfill their humanities, then we will not be in despair. We will be whole, complete, and hopeful. My fathers, you must shape the vision of tomorrow. But in order for that vision to become a reality, you must rededicate yourself to a new beginning. Go back to your families. Go raise and teach your children. Go back and organize throughout this nation to bring about a better day for our people. Our enemies can destroy us one by one, but no one can stop one million men organized and committed. Thank you. There was a second march celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March. Justice or Else, held October 10th, 2015, in Washington, D.C. Here's what BET News had to say. I'm Andre Schoenling, watching BET News Now.
The Million Man March was a watershed moment for the nation back in 1995. Hundreds of thousands of men gathered along the National Mall to atone for the past and commit to a better future. I pray blessing for every... 20 years later, men from all over are again called to assemble for reasons that are personal to those who came. I'm here today because this is my second opportunity to become a living part of history. I was here 20 years ago in 1995. Had to be part of this movement. It's epic right here. All these black people look around you. It's a beautiful thing right now. Where I grew up, like I could look outside and see there was dead people in the street, and that's not really a good feeling. And then, like now to be out here and see other black Americans doing like the same thing that I'm out here doing, trying to uh, unify people, it, it's really good. Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan is again leaving this march, along with other national civil rights groups, with the rallying called Justice or Else. Organizers hope to draw attention to the wrongful killings of black men that capture headlines nationwide. We're demanding justice or else we'll take action. And if that means going to the polls, if that means just mobilizing our, our, our children at a younger age and teaching them, that means starting our own schools where they can get a culturally sensitive program or something like that that really speaks to who they are as people, then that's what we have to do. Our communities is terrible right now. Liquor stores in every corner, you know, there's no opportunity. I got and, you know, I feel sorry for them that they got to grow up and deal with everything that, you know, that they got to deal with now. So it's time for change. And we're just tired of it. If it's not change, we're ready to take it to a next, a next level with it. The first march resulted in nearly 2 million black men registering to vote. And many saw a rise in civic and community engagement. On this 20th anniversary, what do folks hope the end game will be this time around? What I'm hoping is that this makes us more cohesive, more harmonious with each other. So when we see each other, it's just like, hey, I don't know you, but you look like my mom. So I'm going to treat you with respect. I hope that every man and woman can be indoctrinated with the verbs that are being used and spoken out of these microphones to take it back home. And each one of us can take these words and minister to our community. So much has changed since the first Million Man March. But 20 years later, the call for justice is just as loud. That's the news for now. We celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Million Man March here at KPFA. And that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Remember to check out our website, kpfaapprentice.org, just after the show to see pictures of our guests and links to related information to tonight's show. Special thanks to our graduate apprentices tonight, Sarah LaFleur Vetter and Bernard Henderson, for contributing to tonight's show. Our executive producer is Miss M. Our technical director is myself, Frank Sterling. I have also been your host tonight. And Joy Moore is our production consultant. Again, I'm Freewell Franklin. Please, everyone, protect your health and your humanity. And stay tuned because up next is La Onda Bajita. is a community event for October 2020. American Masters presents Michael Tilson Thomas, Where Now Is, on Friday, October 23rd at 6 p.m. This documentary about the legendary conductor of the San Francisco Symphony takes place at pbs.org forward slash American Masters and via the PBS video app. This community announcement is produced by the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing for consideration to calendar at kpfa.org or mail it to 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way, Berkeley, California, 94704. To hear this announcement again, call 510-848-6767, extension 627, or view it online at kpfa.org. 
we need your vote of confidence. For the past few months, KPFA has been pulling off a delicate balancing act, working remotely to bring you coverage of the pandemic, fires, and election information, while also trying to reach our fundraising goals, the money it takes to keep producing this vital coverage. We have exciting plans in the works, debate coverage, confirmation hearings, and election night coverage, but we need your generous support. Please donate today at kpfa.org. Thank you. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.